this is Mike Dilt with the Relax Back UK Show. On the Relax Back UK Show, we explore all kinds of health topics, so keep listening and enjoy the ride. Hi, and thank you for joining me, Mike Dilk, on the Relax Back UK Show. Please remember, if you're listening to a podcast version, to like and share. And if you have any topics that you would like to be covered in the future, you can contact me with some suggestions. And I think probably the best way to do that is via email. My email address is mike at relaxbackuk.com. That's mike at relaxbackuk.com. We start today talking guts. Yeah, so what we're seeing is a link between gut health and diseases beyond the intestinal tract. So, um, you know, cancers, obesity, even disorders of the brain like Alzheimer's and mental health disorders like anxiety and depression. We've always been told a healthy body is a healthy mind and uh, that's what they say. And it seems now that a healthy gut is a healthy body and a healthy mind as well. Jordan Hayworth from the Functional Gut Clinic talks to us about guts. Then COVID has got us used to doing health tests at home. And Frederick Manduka from company Newfoundland has lots of other tests that we can do at home as well. Just to go through them, we have iron deficiency, um, vitamin D, thyroid, kidney function, bowel health, menopause and um, male fertility as well. So please do stick around for a great show. Thank you. This show is cool. Jordan Hayworth is a clinical physiologist from the Functional Gut Clinic and he specialises specialises in guts and digestive disorders. And it seemed like a good first question for him would be, actually, what is a clinical physiologist? A clinical physiologist uh, is essentially a scientist that specialises is it in the investigation of certain parts of the body. So I am a gastrointestinal physiologist, so I specialise in the investigation of digestive disorders. How do you get to be one of them, Jordan? It sounds like, I'm sure you don't, didn't wake up one day and think, I know, I've got to be a clinical physiologist uh, specialising in guts. Sure. So I, I always wanted to be a scientist and researcher, but my area of interest was immunology. So looking at the immune system and its role in things like autoimmune diseases and cancer. Um, however, when I graduated university, there was a job opportunity to become a gastrointestinal physiologist, which sounded interesting. And I'm so glad that I took it now because not only is gut health you know, fundamental to many other conditions, but there is such an overlap with the immune system and that we now know that up to 70 percent of our immune system lies within the gut so there's that crossover that i was always interested in okay fantastic and actually i've spoken to people on this show about um cancer actually and gut health um, yeah speci- that, i mean sure that i'm sure there are lots of different uh cancers and areas of that but it's specifically actually it was breast cancer and gut health yeah yeah, so what we're seeing is a link between gut health and diseases beyond the intestinal tract. So, um, you know, cancers, obesity, even disorders of the brain like Alzheimer's and mental health disorders like anxiety and depression. But what's interesting with cancer is we're seeing that the microbes in our gut or the gut microbiome, as we refer to it collectively, can actually... Um, predict how well you will respond to cancer treatment. So how well you respond to um, immunotherapy in particular. Right. I mean, this this is just uh, phenomenal. And it's all it's all pretty new, isn't it? I mean, well, I'm sure scientists have been working on it for a long time, but it sort of started to hit the news in the last few years, really. Sure. Um, You know, if you think about the, the gut microbiome, it was never really considered a fundamental part of health. But in the last sort of decade, we're realizing uh, it's, you know, because it's so strongly linked to so many other diseases that it's almost like um, an organ in itself. Um, so, yeah, it's yeah. really fascinating stuff. And we've still got a long way to go, but it's an exciting time. 
So I normally wait till the end of the interview to ask the kind of unfair, impossible question. But let me just jump in with it now. I mean, how can that possibly be? I mean, our gut is where the, the, the nutrients are taken out of the food for our body and then it gets yeah. rid of it. Now, how can that possibly relate to Alzheimer's, cancer, you know, all the other stuff you, you mentioned? Sure. So it, it seems to be that the strongest link is to the gut microbiome. So the gut microbiome refers to the community of microbes in our gut. And there's trillions of them living inside of us. That includes bacteria, yeasts, viruses, even parasites. Okay. And they are. Yeah, parasites isn't always a bad thing. Is exactly. It? No, no. There's some parasites that we're starting to see might be linked to positive health outcomes, like, um, you know, being more lean um, and better sort of metabolic health. So, what happens is those, that community, that gut microbiome exists uh, in sort of a balance, like an ecosystem. And if we see that ecosystem out of balance or disrupted, whether that's having too many of the bad kinds of microbes or whether it's just a lack of diversity, so not many different species in there, those are the sort of things that we're seeing strongly linked to the, the development of Alzheimer's disease anxiety, depression, autoimmune disease, and metabolic disorders. Right. So I, I wasn't planning to ask you this, but continuing on the theme of unfair, difficult questions, different people around the world, or even different people in different parts of the same country, eat very differently, you know, yeah. have really quite different diets. Ha has it been noticed, you know, prevalence, more prevalence of, I don't know, Alzheimer's, where the diet is particularly this or that? Yeah, so we're seeing a higher prevalence in um, the more westernised countries, the ones that um, tend to have a diet that is higher in things like ultra-processed foods. Um, so those are the foods that you find in supermarkets with long ingredients lists or that have changed dramatically from the original form. So the example I always use is corn of the cob versus corn tortilla chips. Um, but in, in countries that eat a diverse whole food predominant diet so the mediterranean diet or a japanese diet they're uh, inversely associated with alzheimer's disease so they have much lower prevalence compared to the west okay all right so right no question the gut is important for all kinds of different things um and lots of people do suffer from well just not feeling quite right in the guts yeah <laughs> you know, it's like, Irrit every other person seems to have irritable bowel syndrome. Is that is that really the case or is it just what people say because they've heard someone else say it? Well, it's, it's quite a surprising statistic that 40% of the UK population experience digestive problems, you know, that are akin to irritable bowel syndrome. So these are things like bloating, uh, excessive wind, flatulence, abdominal discomfort, changes to the bowel habit like diarrhea and constipation. So that's almost one in two people. Um, but irritable bowel syndrome is a specific condition that affects more like, um, you know, around one in 10. Um, but everyone can experience some di digestive discomfort. Um, that is quite normal, for example, to feel bloated after, you know, you've eaten a large meal or you might have had one too many drinks. That's normal. But if you're getting that regularly, then that's when it's time to maybe speak to a doctor to see what's going on. But surprisingly, um, almost one in two people who report these symptoms don't actually speak to a doctor about them and it's quite important to speak out because you know we, we we need to make sure that there's nothing sinister going on so it's important that we sort of break the poo taboo so to speak break the poo taboo all right yeah uh, that sounds like a good phrase uh, let's just look at the that you say make sure there's nothing sinister all right yeah. what 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 do you mean by that what could potentially be a little sinister so there are sort of alarm symptoms that we need to look out for or red flags so that would be blood in the stool um that would be unintentional weight loss so losing weight you know when you're not really changing much um it might be feeling fatigued quite often when um you know almost like the, you can't get out of bed or you find it difficult to exercise so the, these are things where if you're getting digestive discomfort alongside those you should definitely go and speak to a, a, a doctor about them 
Okay, and it potentially might be cancer. Is that well? That well, that's it. So it's especially when it comes to gut health. So like blood in the stool can be a sign of potentially cancer or inflammatory bowel disease. Um, so it's definitely worth speaking to the doctor if you notice that. And with things like bowel cancer, it's it's on the rise. So there are a lot more people developing bowel cancer. But it's one of the easiest to treat if it's recognized earlier. So the sooner you, you get it um, found out, the, the more likely you are to, to be yeah. treated. Early yeah. diagnosis is the key, like, yeah. to, like many of those things. All right. So look, back back to the gut. And to keep, so it seems like we need our guts to keep us healthy. So yeah. what would she be doing? What, would, what should we be doing? Because presumably how the state of our gut depends on what we put in it what we eat and drink so um what should we you know yeah what should we so do? so the first thing i always say is to actually not do anything too drastic so don't remove things from your diet unnecessarily it's quite trendy to go gluten free or grain free or dairy free but unless you have an actual allergy to them this can be detrimental to your gut health in the long run because if i go back to the, the gut microbiome so a diverse gut microbiome with lots of different species in there is key to gut health, which means you need to eat a diverse diet. So aim to eat as many different kinds of plant foods as possible. The science suggests aiming for around 30 different plant foods each week. And that sounds like a lot, but this includes whole grains, beans, nuts, seeds, herbs and spices. So season your food well, and you can even cheat a little bit. So things like granola, which contains lots of different nuts, seeds, grains, or you can make your own coleslaw. And it also includes things like coffee, tea, even red wine to some extent. Um, and another thing that is usually popular at the moment, but we're starting to see a lot of gut health benefits from it in, in the research are fermented foods. So these are things like yogurt, kefir, which is a fermented milk, sauerkraut, fermented cabbage. Uh, sourdough bread so what happens with these foods is they're cultured with beneficial bacteria and yeast which helps to change the sort of matrix of that food and it's easier to digest but also what we're seeing with the research is might have more benefits to gut health okay you mentioned sourdough bread there now obviously you you know the microbes are very much needed in the rising of the bread and all that but then you yeah. bake it doesn't that just kill them all off it does, but what happens with sourdough is because it's fermented for longer, it becomes easier to digest. So for people with irritable bowel syndrome, a lot of them will feel an improvement when they go gluten-free. But what we know from the research is it's not actually the gluten causing the problems in most people with IBS. Yes, there's a small percentage of the population with celiac disease who need to go gluten-free, but for those with IBS, it's not the gluten in wheat. It's these compounds or carbohydrates that are difficult to digest called FODMAPs. And with sourdough bread, the bacteria break down those FODMAPs, which means that they're, they don't get fermented in your gut, so you're less likely to get bloating, you're less likely to get stomach cramps. Okay, all right. So the, the key really is a, a balanced diet with yep. a, a varied balanced diet. And what was that number of different... Um, so 30 is the goal, 30 is the tally. But remember, this includes herbs, spices, uh, drinks like teas, coffee. All right. Yeah. All right. Now, if you're doing all that, but you still got issues, what, whatever it might be, and, and it seems like a lot of us do, um, you know, for whatever reasons, presumably stress brings it on as well, does it? Sure, yeah. Stress is a massive, silent gut health wrecker um so stress you know if you're constantly stressed you you tend to be in the more fight or flight response and this significantly impacts digestion and um yeah so it, it can eat what we're seeing is that stress can also disrupt the balance of microbes in the gut as well right so you could be eating all the right things but be stressed what yeah. about if you're eating all the right things but actually um you have to have a course of antibiotics. I mean, that can knock out the bugs in your gut, can't it? Yeah, antibiotics um, obviously wipe out a lot of the gut microbiome. Um, and what happens is it, we see in people who tend to have recurrent use of antibiotics, then they're, they're more likely to go on and develop some of these conditions like autoimmune diseases. 
Um, another another big thing that people forget about is food poisoning as well. So food poisoning dr- dramatically changes the dynamic of the gut microbiome. So it's what you know. What can we do if you know? Some, we, obviously, sometimes we need to take these antibiotics, not to over prescribe them for things like the flu because they don't necessarily work for that. Um, but when they are needed, um, what can we do to try and recuperate that that gut microbiome? So we've seen a little bit of evidence that maybe taking a probiotic alongside the antibiotics can reduce um, some of the side effects like diarrhea. Um, but it's probably you know comes down to diet and how we can re re um, replenish those microbes that are lost. Sure, sure. All right. So put those to one side. We're, we're not suffering from stress. We haven't taken mm-hmm. antibiotics. We're eating okay, but we still got problems. Um, yeah. So we're obviously unlucky in our in our gut health, our gut life. But any, any suggestions? I know I know you've got something that you're you're keen to chat about. Sure. So some people will have you know a, a good balanced diet as you alluded to but they're still getting issues and that's where they might need a helping hand with uh, a supplement that supports gut health so um i've worked closely with with juvia which is a digestive balance supplement and it was developed by some of the leading investigators in gut health it contains a unique natural ingredient called enzyme rich malt extract or erme so it's made from 100 percent sustainable barley and it's full of digestive enzymes. So what we found was that in three quarters, we did a research uh, study, and in three quarters of the people that took it saw an improvement in bloating, abdominal discomfort, and had more regular bowel movement. So the way that Juvia works is because it contains those digestive enzymes, it helps to break down some of those tricky to digest carbohydrates. And carbohydrates are the favorite fuel source of bacteria in your gut both good and bad so if you do have more of those bad guys and they're fermenting the carbohydrates you're going to get a lot of gas produced you're going to get a lot of bloating flatulence can also change the bowel habit but juvia set by taking it with meals um, you can help to break those down so what a lot of people do with ibs or digestive issues is they tend to cut foods out and they feel better Okay, so the example I always go back to is gluten. So you cut gluten out, you feel better, but it's not actually the gluten. It's these tricky to digest carbohydrates in the wheat. By taking Juvia, it allows you to have more food freedom. So you can eat more of those foods that you have been avoiding because the digestive enzymes help to break them down. Okay, you mentioned a couple of things there that I I just want to pick up on. You said, okay, some research has been done to to, to, to stop this. Uh, uh, Enzyme, what was it? Enzyme regulated. Yeah, so it's an enzyme rich malt extract or erme. So that's the, the ingredient in Juvia. Um, okay. So you, you're you probably familiar with malt extract. Uh, it's yeah. used in baking, it's been used for centuries, used to make things like malt loaf. But this is a unique formula that contains a lot of digestive enzymes that break down carbohydrates. And this, so this when is derived it, from barley. Yeah. And so, yeah. And so how, how do you get it from barley? So I think it's, uh, you know, it's part of the malting process. So the way okay. they sort of dry the grains for making hops and beer and, and that kind yeah. of thing. Uh, yeah, that sounds exciting because you use yeah. that for making beer. So can yeah, you just drink a load of beer and you'll be fine? Of, unfortunately, no. Um, yeah, unfortunately not. Uh, so the malt extract, the, the Erme, contains these unique digestive enzymes, which are key to sort of rebalancing the gut microbiome. Okay. So then the other question that I always ask when people say, oh, yeah, you know, research has been done on it. So, okay. So is this is this peer reviewed published papers kind of research? Can I yes. go and have a look at it? Yeah. So there's uh, the study that I led, um, which was published last year in the journal Gut. So that was in. That sounds like a very appropriate journal. Yeah. It's one of the leading journals in you know, gut, gut health with one of the largest impact factors. But there's there's ongoing research with it, too. Um, so there's some larger trials going on in in Australia and uh, some other places uh, in the UK. So it's a really exciting product backed by science. And like I said, we, we saw dramatic improvements in over three quarters of the people who took it. Right. So do you just take it for a little while or if you need it, it's like you've got to take it forever? How does it work? Yeah, so what, what we're seeing is um, 
we do sort of a, a six week intense phase of it. So you take it twice per day with meals and that's what we call the rebalancing phase. Um, some people actually for the first couple of weeks taking it might feel not actually better, but feel a little bit strange. And that's as those microbes in the gut sort of re, you know, replenishing. And then during the study, we noticed that at maybe like week three or week four, people start to see, you know, a really good improvement. And then people can then adjust the dose to see what works for them. So maybe they reduce it from twice per day to once per day. Okay. So um, it's suggested that you keep on taking it though, probably. Yeah, yeah. So we see it as um, an adjunctive or supportive um, yeah. thing with, with a normal right. diet. Yeah. All right. So, th so this, this is research that you did. You wrote the paper. Yeah. Okay. How, how many people did it um, take into account? What was, what was the end number? So ours was a relatively small study because it was one of the first. So it was in 20. Right. Um, but like three quarters of, of them saw an improvement, which was okay. you know really fascinating. So that's paving the way for larger trials. And we're getting, the, you know, one of the most important things that we're getting is really good feedback from the, the, the users who are using it already. Yeah. yeah. Okay, excellent. Okay, all, the, all this is very good news. If, if people want to find out a little bit more about this Hermé, um, yeah. which then goes into the product called Juvia. Yeah. Is that, is that, that's how it works. That's it? right, yeah. Okay. yeah. Uh, how can they find out a bit more? And if they want to have a look at the uh, the paper that you published, are there link, some links to that as well? Yeah, so I think if they firstly go to the Juvia website, which is juvia.me, so that's J-U-V-I-A dot me. And I think our research is linked on the site as well. Uh, but if they're struggling to find that, then they can go to our website, that's the functional gut clinic dot com. And we publish all of, of the research that we've done from there. Okay. So did you do the research uh, in combination with a, a university or at the clinic? No, at, at the clinic. So we were the main sponsor. So we're, we're a, a clinic that's based in Manchester, London and Cambridge. But we have a massive, you know, R&D um, focus. So we, we run lots of clinical trials. We've done some for probiotic companies, prebiotic companies, and obviously Juvia as well. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely fascinating. This is this is because I it's like every day I come across someone who complains of having, you know, their guts in turmoil. So it's obviously yeah. something that really does affect a lot of people. I'm kind of fortunate, I think, in that it, it doesn't really happen to me. So mm. I, I'm just one of life's lucky ones. But I know a lot of people do suffer uh, from this. Uh, so I, I think this kind of thing could potentially be useful and, and help a lot of people. So um so, Jordan, many thanks for chatting. Thanks for having me back. The next section is about home testing for all kinds of different things. My guest is Frederick Manduka, and he's co-founder of Newfoundland Diagnostics. And I asked him if people really are getting more interested in their health and doing tests at home and looking after themselves in general. And uh, if so... What, what is driving this whole change in people's outlook and behaviour? I think it's um, a very interesting space at the moment. We've seen across the board um, a rise in people wanting to take health into their own hands, wanting to understand more about their bodies, the symptoms they might be feeling. I think we've had a, uh, <laughs> a real wave of Google doctors, which is you type your symptoms into Google and it come back with some you know, quite scary things that's not particularly helpful to anyone, not people themselves or GPs that they then go and see. And having a more nuanced approach where people now very familiar with lateral flow tests, um, thanks to one of the only things, thanks to the COVID pandemic, you can now see people wanting to have... Is that that's searching for a positive in the COVID pandemic, isn't it? <laughs> exactly it's very you know, good there's probably a couple them. more but it's, you know, they're few and far yeah. between so we'll, we'll, exactly. we'll take what ones we can <laughs> exactly and and one of them is probably people feeling more familiar with doing a test themselves at home and reading the result and seeing whether it's positive or negative drawing those similarities to, you know to a pregnancy test and now you can do them with our tests from everything to thyroid function to bowel health to prostate cancer um, to vitamin D levels, our deficiency levels, and even the the menopause. And I think that's a real shift. Um, and making them affordable is obviously a huge part as well. We know that we're in a, a cost of living crisis. And 
there's been a lot of inflation in the in the last year and having a test that's under 10 pounds that you can just do in your own home regularly and get the result yourself in in 10 minutes with an over 95 percent accuracy has has a lot of appeal right so you mentioned a few tests there kind of now we're used to them on the back of doing the the, the, the covid test so do, can you mention them again what sort of tests are there available you sort of went through a little list there but just revisit that yeah quickly. yeah so we have um, a partnership with tesco's where in over 600 stores we have our range of tests and just to go through them we have iron deficiency um, vitamin d thyroid kidney function, bowel health, menopause, and um, male fertility as well. Right. And also, I must admit, I took a sneaky peek at your website before we started, and you got a couple that are, are soon to be available. Yeah. So we have the prostate cancer test, which is measuring your PSA levels, something that's really exciting. Again, there's nothing quite like it in the market where you can take an affordable test um, to, to see if you have a, an elevated PSA level, which is obviously a lead indicator of prostate cancer and early screening is just so vital for um for, for both bowel cancer and prostate cancer and so significantly increases the chances of survival post diagnosis and then so that, we also have, sorry, 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 sorry. The, um, urinary tract infection test coming soon and also the hiv test coming soon all right so are, are these tests are they are they done on blood on urine on poo um, or yes to it, all of all of that yeah it, it varies um based on each one so most i would say are blood um but some are urine for example the kidney function is urine menopause is urine um the only one that's a stool sample is the um, bowel health um test and then um yeah so urine samples again with menopause kidney function yeah. so it so, varies based on each test yeah, yeah. so so testing your urine or your poo because you know that that's meant to come out so at home i can i can see that you know we can do that blood's meant to stay in so is, is that yeah. a, not a little trickier doing a blood test at home yeah it it poses um challenges but we feel very confident um that we've you know covered off every, all, all of the challenges and it's had significant regulatory review um, all of these tests are heavily regulated both by the mhra and um, by the notified bodies in europe and for the blood test, you're provided a lancet in each test, and it's just a pinprick into the side of, of your finger. Um, it's not painful. Um, and then we provide a plaster and an alcohol wipe alcohol wipe as well. So it, it shouldn't pose too much of a challenge. Okay, so, so it's a prick test. You know, you're not sticking something yeah. in and, and sucking blood out. No, no it's you, not. You wouldn't, you wouldn't trust us like to do that, would you? I'm hoping. I wouldn't trust myself to do that. <laughs> so, <laughs> no. Yeah. OK. All right. So now with the COVID test, there was a lot of talk in the media about false positives and some of the issues that causes. Now, with, actually, you mentioned it earlier in the chat, but any test has a percentage of the time where it might not work for a whole host of reasons. Do these tests have um, or what? what is the chance of a false positive in these kind of tests? Yeah, so the the key really is how well the test is done. In a laboratory setting or when the test is done correctly, the chance of a false positive is minimal, um, less than 1% for most of our tests. It's called, the scientific term would be specificity of the test. Um, the issue is when the test isn't done correctly. And I think that's why we've put such an emphasis on not just putting the instructions for use leaflet in the test, which can often be quite a long bit of paper with lo lots of small print and, yeah. you know, isn't always the easiest to navigate, but also a leaflet in each test, which really simplifies it with pictures. And then also putting the videos of how to use the tests in our app and also on our website. It just minimizes the chance of the test being done incorrectly. We saw obviously with the COVID test, people were even putting <laughs> Coca-Cola or lemon juice in a, a lateral flow test to generate a false positive. So, they wouldn't have to go to work or to school. And I know that's an extreme example, but um, it's the idea that, again, if the test isn't done properly or a contaminant is found in the test or something goes wrong, then it could generate a false positive. But actually, when the test is done correctly, it's um, extremely small. Right. OK. Uh, human error. You know, that's 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 the issue that you, you can't control or people just doing slightly different things. But, you know, all right. Interesting. 
if people get answers to these tests, and it might be that they get the right answer or they've done it incorrectly and they get false positive, um, my, my, my thought might be to some extent, actually, this could be causing a lot of worry and a lot of anxiety. Um, and, you know, because sometimes you go to a GP and he says, OK, we'll do the test or actually, you know, I don't think we need to do the test. And there could be a host of reasons why they say that. But aren't we generating a lot of anxiety for sort of no real reason here? Yeah, so I think <clears throat> it's an interesting argument and I think it, it revolves around what you're actually testing for. I think um, with regards to health anxiety, there are a lot of tests which encompass absolutely everything. So there's a blood test that you can do. You'll pay between 100 or, or 80 to 100 pounds and it will test for absolutely everything, including things like elevated sodium levels or different you know, minute biomarkers in your, in your blood. And then you'll see a yellow or a red and you think, well, I need to go and see a doctor. But actually an elevated sodium level in your blood is not a reason to see a doctor. And that could generate <clears throat> um, some anxiety. But if you look at our tests, um, for example, the bowel health test, which is probably the most extreme um, uh, test you could get a positive result to, actually, if there is blood to be found in your stool, it's an invisible speck of blood. It's called fecal occult blood. It generally could indicate an issue with your bowel health, but also specifically a polyps or a cancer any doctor, any GP on the NHS would immediately advise you to see a doctor if you find fecal occult blood in your stool. Right. And it's one of those things where actually screening someone early reduces the chance or increases the chance of survival um, you know, uh, to a multiple that is a no-brainer that everyone would want to screen oh. for fecal occult blood at an earlier level. And that test just doesn't exist at the moment. I mean, the NHS are sending out tests once every two years if you're over the age of 50, but having a test that you can do quickly at home regularly to screen, especially if you feel symptoms is definitely a good thing, <clears throat> a, a definitely a good thing um, to have available. And, and actually for the bowel one, the NHS is having a drive currently yeah. uh, to get people to actually do the test that is sent to them. So um, yes, I'm, I'm sort of with you um, on, on that one. Absolutely. So, yeah. Fr from these range of tests, if you, I don't know, you, you maybe you, you do the iron deficiency test, and you take it and you think, oh, goodness, OK, I've got a low score. It says I'm iron deficient. If you take these tests to your GP, you know, it, is he going to take you seriously? Because hopefully you will with the bowel cancer one, because we, you, you just yeah. mentioned that. But, you know, there's a lot of other tests here. Well, the, is the GP going to say, oh, goodness, right, we must do something about this? Or will he just say, well, yeah, you know, don't worry about it. Try eating a bit more red meat or, you know, what, what's going to happen? Yeah, so it, it completely depends on each test. Like you say, I think in terms of the GP's response to a lateral flow test reading, is it's really helpful. These tests are used in hospitals all over the country and all over the world. And it's one of those things where 70% of all doctors' decisions are made on the back of a diagnostic result. So going to a doctor and saying, look, I've taken a test. It says that my vitamin D levels are low. It's significantly more efficient than going to the doctor and say, I feel a bit run down, because that could be a hundred different things. Whilst if you say, look, I've had a low vitamin D result reading, or I've had a low iron deficiency reading, the doctor will then process that information, say, well, it could be related to this. You might be able to fix this from a lifestyle change. And when the doctor puts the whole picture together, it actually is a really important piece of the puzzle that he right. can then take away. It may save, you know, two appointments into one which takes you know, waiting times down from the NHS and also takes a lot of the stress of then having to wait for a diagnostic result on the NHS. Yeah, okay. So you, you think it's likely to you know, help the NHS? The NHS won't get overrun with the tested well, if you like, you know, the walking tested well. Yeah, <clears throat> I think that's um, a big difference between the you know, all or nothing blood tests where you test for 100 yeah. different things then you've got somebody who's perfectly healthy that is then concerned about something. But because these tests are very specific and very targeted, it's only for, for example, a lower vitamin D, D level. And actually, most people taking these tests are already aware that they may have an existing problem. For example, a lot of people know they may have an underactive thyroid. And taking a thyroid test means they can then go to a doctor and say, look, I know I have an underactive thyroid. I've tested positive for a low TSH, which is the hormone that your thyroid produces. Sure. And then the doctor can say, okay, that's really useful information. This is what I recommend. It, it just makes the whole process a lot easier. And we also have much more information 
on our app and our website and in our leaflets explaining exactly what the next steps um, are. And they're all taken from official NHS advice and uh, NHS doctors as well. Okay. All right. No, I, I, I can see that actually, because I, when I first thought of this, I thought, you know, is this kind of the case of a, a little knowledge is a dangerous thing? And um, because in some instances it really can, because like, we all know someone who's going on about their health and, oh, I'm not well today. You know, it drives everybody nuts. Um, but if this is a little more targeted and um, pinpointed, um, I, can, I can, yeah, I can see that uh, certainly helping. Um, so, Frederick, I, I often ask um, unfair questions. Uh, so, and I've got one saved up for you. Um, as, as I said, this probably is a bit unfair. So just a, a warning. But I do like data. All right. I, I, you know, numbers and figures and proof. And uh, do you have any data of lives saved? You know, so, someone did one of these tests and thought, all right, yeah. this looks a bit odd. I better go to the doctor. And the doctor said, right, you were right to come. You need to go to hospital tomorrow or, you know, go on a course of treatment that dramatically saved them something horrible or even saved their life. Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, I wish we did have that data to hand. That would be wonderful. We, we funnily enough, get more of the individual stories. So someone saying they've actually taken our bowel health test and it came back with a positive and they would have had absolutely no idea they had bowel cancer. Then they had a screening and they had a treatment even before stage one bowel cancer and it saved their life. The, the chance of surviving bowel cancer um, when you have a late diagnosis are about 10%. It's really difficult. Um, but when you have an early diagnosis, it's above 65%. So it, it just makes a huge difference. And we do hear these stories all the time. And we had another story of someone who took our thyroid test, who had an underactive thyroid, who couldn't get an appointment um, with a doctor about their thyroid for six months. And they suspected the entire time they took one of our tests, they immediately knew, and then they were able to fast track um, a treatment course. And it's stories like these that really give us motivation to um, and, and proof of concept yeah. that we know we're doing something that's really helpful and beneficial to the UK population. So in that case, if, if I say, if I, if I, if I was the thyroid person and I took the thyroid test, if I called my GP and spoke to a gatekeeper and said, look, actually, I've just taken a test and I know yeah. I've got a problem. Would they take that seriously? Or before long, everyone's going to be trying that one, aren't they? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, especially because with the thyroid, they will know, okay, the pituitary, the pituitary gland in the brain is not sending enough of the thyroid hormone to the thyroid and that, that's what's causing the problems. They'll know ex immediately what to do. Um, the question is, obviously, it will depend on each GP surgery, where you are in the country, for how long it will take to get that treatment. But in terms of in a doctor's mind, they will know exactly what the problem is once the test has been explained to them. And once they know the result, it's it's as simple as that. Um, but again, obviously, wait times vary on the NHS. But having this information could save six or seven months of waiting around, not sure what to do, because actually, unless you do a test, the, the symptom overlap is just so wide and varied that it's very difficult for a doctor to actually know what to do. And they have such pressing concerns. They might think, you know, immediately, is this cancer? Is this going to cost someone's life? Well, no. So maybe let's not take X course of treatment or um, fast track it. Whilst, again, having a diagnostic result just makes uh, the, the pathway so much clearer for both the doctor and patient. Sure. I, I mean, I'm definitely in favour of people being more involved in their health rather than just like, you know, dumping it on the doctor, you know, you fix yeah. me. Because I, actually, I think, well, probably all over the world, but certainly the great British public has suffered from that of, you know, the NHS will fix me. It's up to them. I don't need to get involved. But now we are, it seems, have, have an appetite for getting a bit more involved. How can we know when we maybe we should take one of the, the tests that you have available? Uh, because you know there's a there's a wide range of tests so presumably there's a wide range of symptoms um yeah over to you how you know yeah what absolutely next? i think it's a fair question i think it comes under two categories one is is if you have symptoms and you don't know why you're having the symptoms we have a website that details exactly what symptoms would correlate to each test and that's oh, right. where you can okay. take two or three tests comparing with the symptoms from our website and say okay, well, actually, it's not a low vitamin D level. It's not an iron deficiency. It's actually an underactive thyroid. For example, it could be 
that kind of thing. Um, and then the other category is people who know they have an existing problem. So for example, someone who knows they struggle to maintain their vitamin D levels can now take a test for eight pounds off the shelves of Tesco and test every five months, every six months, every three months, however they feel necessary to say, okay, I'm actually, my vitamin D levels are sufficient now, or actually they've dipped. Why is that? What can I do to increase them? And actually having that monitoring is so vital, especially at that price point, because the other vitamin D level uh, tests are, are well above 40 pounds, 60 pounds, 70 pounds, or you have to wait through the NHS pathway, which again can take such a long period of time. There's actually a new thing entering into the market that in the overall toolkit, is really helpful. We're not trying to, you know, say this is a, a golden sort of bullet or anything that just takes out everything. Actually, this is just a very small part of an overall um, healthcare strategy for the UK that can just add and give people a new option to complement the other already existing services like going to see your GP or taking a full laboratory test. It's just a, a component, a tool in the toolkit, so to speak. Sure. So something you mentioned there, you said that the prices are coming down. Is Is that because there's a change in the technology or the more of these tests have been made and used. So there's economies of scale, you know, because not long ago, home tests were actually pretty bloody expensive, but you know, you're saying these are, tend to be under 10 pounds. So this is a dramatic change. Yeah. That's something we've really wanted to push is being almost a, a disruptor within the healthcare industry and, you know, lowering the prices for these tests. I think a lot of the reasons why the, the test prices were so high is because it was actually a different test. You would take a blood sample, you would then package it up, you would send it in the post, it would then go to a laboratory and they'd then run the test and then they'd email the result back to you. But that, you know, again, takes 48 to 72 hours to get your result back. You then have to send it in the post. It's much more expensive. And then all your data is obviously logged externally. Whilst this, you control your result, you control all your data, no one's storing it, and you get the result in 10 minutes at home. And, and that's why... It's, again, just a new thing for the UK market. And Tesco's has been obviously groundbreaking and being the first major retailer to, to stop these um, range of rapid tests with us. Yeah, OK, interesting. I've, I've got I've got a good a good friend who who he really likes sport and he thinks outside of the box a lot. And I said, look, I'm talking to this guy about home testing. What should I ask him? And he thought for a moment, he said, look, where is it all going? You know, are we going to get to the point we have like a continuous readout where you get up in the morning and you stick your finger in something and it says, oh, this morning you could have these problems. And he said you could take that one step further because, OK, I'll tell you the whole story. It's, it's slightly bonkers. But, you know, he, he loves football. And he was saying, could it get to the point where a footballer could get information that, OK, you're at risk of an injury if you train today? Don't train today because these footballers, you know, they're worth a lot of money. If they're out for a week or two, this is big news. You know, so how how far is all this going? And this is this continuous readout, you know, a, a possibility for the future. Yeah, it's it's interesting where it's going. I think, um, to be completely frank, the technology for diagnostic testing, at least rapid diagnostic testing is quite far off with injury prediction. But uh, I know with the way sports science is going that they're feeling like they can predict hamstring injuries, for example, for a footballer based on how many sprints they've done and recording it on their on their computers. And that's you know, all very interesting. But I think in terms of rapid testing, we want to give people as many options as possible. We're certainly not pressuring anyone to take a test um, unnecessarily. It's just there as an option for people who want to take health into their own hands and see, for example, you know, I've been feeling this, I know my body, is it this? And then they can get a result that's affordable and quick right there in front of them. And that's just something we want to provide and offer as best a service as possible. I think where it goes will be really interesting. I know there are lots of things that people, you know, would love to test for. Um, there's a lot of, for example, athletes, perhaps like your friend who want to know their testosterone levels before they train. Um, and, you know, there are other forms of diagnostic tests which can do that. The, the rapid lateral flow tests don't have a test for that right now. But again, in the future, they might. And that might be something really useful for a lot of people. Yeah, Inter I, I think the, the whole topic is, uh, is is very interesting. And I, and I can see it, you know, being more and more popular and people getting really excited about it. But if, if people are listening to this little chat and thinking, yeah, actually, I'd like to find out a bit more of this about this, even take one of these tests, what should they do next? I'm, I'm sure... Yeah, point point them to a good source of information. Yeah, absolutely. So the the best source of information would be our website, 
um, www.newfoundland.io. Um, and that provides all the information regarding symptoms, next steps, what each test tests for, and then has all the tests on our website. The um, other option as well is to go to your local Tesco's. It's not in the Tesco's Expresses, the small stores, but any of the larger stores, it should have our, our full range of tests in the um, health and wellness section. So that's what I'd recommend to do. And yeah, try, try out the test for yourself. We'd love to hear um, as much feedback as possible for what people think. Um, and yeah, it's a it's a new option to to take a rapid lateral flow test for lots and lots of different health markers. Good. All right, Frederick, thank you very much indeed for chatting. Very interesting. Perfect. Thank you, Mike. Really appreciate it. Thank you very much to my guests on this week's show. And they were Jordan Hayworth talking about guts and um, Frederick Manduka of Newfoundland Diagnostics talking about home health tests. And of course, a big thank you to you for listening and have a healthy week until next week. That was the Relax Back UK show with me, Mike Dill. Thank you for listening and please do join us again next time.